All right, welcome back everyone to another episode of Early Career Immunology Series. Um, we are happy to have Craig Maynard here with us today from UAB. And Craig is a mucosal immunologist whose research focuses on immune regulation of the gastrointestinal tract. So Craig, um, his aim of his research is to elucidate the cellular and molecular mechanisms that synergize promote immune homeostasis uh, with the gut microbiota. And the overlying view is to understand how these perturbations um, of these mechanisms of the mechanisms predisposes to inflammatory bowel disease or IBD. So Craig's early work um, at UAB, where he did his PhD in the Weaver lab, uh, basically was seeking to understand the phenotypic uh, distributions of intestinal regulatory T cells at steady state. And uh, he did this by producing an IL-10 reporter mouse, which is very useful for the field. Um, he also identified other critical pathways uh, whereby these regulatory networks are controlled. Um, in his ongoing studies in his lab at UAB, uh, his lab seeks to determine how the synergy between regulatory pathways and anti-commensal antibodies continuously maintains homeostasis with um, mucosal associated microbiota. Um, and also in newer collaborative, uh, collaborative studies supported by the Cronin Colitis Foundation, uh, Craig is exploring the mechanisms uh, whereby early life adversity predisposes to enhance susceptibility uh, or severity of chronic intestinal inflammation. So Craig has won um, numerous awards for his scholarship, uh, most recently uh, receiving a Pittman Scholar Award and also a career in immunology fellowship from uh, AEI. And so if you have any questions for Craig uh, during his talk, why don't you just go ahead and hold them and we can uh, ask them after Craig has finished speaking. And then I can read those off to Craig and he will address any questions you have at the end of the talk. Uh, Craig, thanks for being with us here today. And we're really excited to hear about your ongoing work. All righty, thanks. Thanks to you, Tim, and to the organizers of this seminar series for this, this opportunity to talk about some of what we've been doing over the last few years. Um, so as Tim said, um, I'm a mucosal immunologist whose work really focuses on trying to understand the, the, how the immune, uh, how disruptions in immune regulation predispose to inflammatory bowel diseases. And so just to introduce those of us who don't think about IBD every day to IBD, um, the disease that we collectively refer to as inflammatory bowel diseases um, are generally aberrant immune responses to the intestinal microbiota. And as of 2017, so this data is a little bit dated, um, the global incidence of IBD was almost 7 million, with about one and a half million of that accounted for uh, in the United States. As we know, the, the two main forms of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And you know, symptoms vary from severe abdominal pain, that rear, and most importantly, we don't really have a cure for IBD. And so the disease, core, the disease follows this chronic relapsing rating course. With regards to Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, I mean, Crohn's disease can really occur anywhere in, in the GI tract. Um, it's predominantly seen in the, in, the, in the small and, and, and the large intestine, in the ileum, uh, in the colon, as this patchy inflammation interspersed with regular uh, normal tissue. Ulcerative colitis, is, as the name suggests, is more restricted to the colon, predominantly distal colon, as demonstrated here. And the diagnoses are really done on endoscopy. Okay? And so this is, these are two images from a uh, colonoscopy of normal Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, and then Crohn's disease actually showing you the emergence of that uh, cobblestone appearance. In ulcerative colitis, you have this superficially, superficially denuded uh, tissue. And so, as you can imagine, in an environment like the intestines, where there's so much um, antigenic stimulation, bacteria, food, drugs, um, the, the there are multiple mechanisms and pathways that can actually lead to what manifests in this company as what you're seeing on my screen. And so research over a number of years has really settled on you know, that the fact that IBD is extremely multifactorial and there are multiple factors that, are, that, that contribute to this. And, and the, the thing you should notice about this is that there is even overlap between these multiple factors. And so the, 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 there's a genetic component which it's believed to account for about one third of IBD risk. The, the immune response to the commensal bacteria in our intestines and to pathogenic bacteria passing through the intestines. And 
as Tim mentioned, that we have um, gotten involved in studying the, the impact of stress as an environmental trigger in, in contributing to IBD. And so the point of this cartoon is really to drive home the, 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 the idea that IBD is extremely multifactorial and a lot of things come together to manifest in what a patient would, would experience as, as inflammatory bowel disease. So my colleague Chuck Elson likes to say that you know, IBD won the GWAS lottery uh, because they were, they were at the outset of really, at the, when the you know, association studies really took off, um, IBD was kind of at, at the forefront of actually um, exploring genetic, genetic contributions to these inflammatory diseases. And this, this uh, cartoon, this, this, this figure is a little dated, uh, around 2011, but I, I, I use it because it illustrates the, the two genes that we are gonna be talking a little bit about and the, and the, the overlap that we're exploring between these two. And so the first one is interleukin 10, uh, regulatory cytokine uh, produced by, that can be produced by multiple cells of, of the immune system and non-immune um, cells. And Icosligan, a, a B7 family member that's expressed in IgM percentage cells, and we'll, we'll get into uh, our reasons for going after this connection in a while. But the, the our intention at the outset of this was to try to really understand how pathways that may be regulating IL-10 expression in intestines may be contributing to IBD susceptibility, and that'll become clearer in a second. So we are we, we knew prior to, to, to starting these studies of uh, the importance of IL-10 as a susceptibility locus for, for IBD. Icos Ligand was one of those lower ones that uh, came on the scene. Um, and the thing about the genome-wide association studies are genes identified by GWAS is that until additional work is done, it's usually unclear which way the gene expression goes. And so, for us, it was it was very timely uh, when a few years before we started to work that Clara Abraham had published that there's a loss of function um, with Icos ligand risk allele that's associated with ileal Crohn's disease. And so, as a group that was working predominantly in the mouse, it meant that perhaps a mouse model where we could induce deficiency of Icos ligand would be um, at least in the same direction of the, the way in which Icos ligand is modulated in, 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 in IBD patients. So, and just to remind you, like I said, we, we, we already knew IL-10 and we've done some earlier work on, 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 on IL-10 in situ pieces and gut, but we already knew that IL-10 is a, what we refer to as an essential mediator of blood immune homeostasis. And the, the, the best examples are in, in the small example of human patients, of pediatric patients where it, it, it was uh, discovered that a loss of function uh, mutation in the IL-10 receptor resulted in severe early onset um, enteritis. And it's demonstrated here where um, what, what happens is that there's a truncation of the IL-10 receptor gene that results in the inability of patient macrophages to respond to, 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 to LPS stimulation in this case. And so uh, what, what happens is that under normal circumstances, IL-10 is able to suppress the, the pro-inflammatory effects, pro-inflammatory functions of macrophages in, in, in healthy people where there's a normal, like normal expression of the IL-10 receptor. But in patients with that mutation, the, 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 the IL-10 is incapable of suppressing that inflammation. And, and, it so, and, and what was observed in this, in, in this, uh, this patient was this, this very severe perianal disease that could be rescued by a, a bone marrow transplant. And so the, the, the importance of IL-10 for gut immune regulation was really established. Now, this is a monogenic association of, uh, a, a, a monogenic association of, uh, I guess, IL-10 with IBD, which monogenic, IBD is not really a monogenic disease. And so in, in most cases, this is not what's really happening. What's, hap what's actually happening is a, a number of factors, including maybe an IL-10 a, a deficient, amount, a, a redu reduced amount of IL-10, but very seldom complete loss of IL-10 signaling as you see in this patient. And so 
we were still interested in what are the factors that may be collaborating with IL-10 on the circumstances where it's knocked down by, as a result of some other polymorphisms. The, so the, the, as I said, the defect here was that IL-10 is unable to suppress the effects of uh, bacterial stimulation on macrophages. And subsequently, it was demonstrated that Yes, the, the, the business end of IL-10 function in the intestines is actually via its expression on blood macrophages. And so here macrophage specific deletion of the IL-10 receptor actually results in spontaneous colitis. And so you combine these, you see where again, similar defect IL-10 receptor, macrophage can get a signal, spontaneous colitis ensues. And about 10 years earlier, Axel um, Rose and one more had shown that deletion of IL-10 only in CD4 T cells results in spontaneous colitis. And so here we are comparing the incidence of rectal prolapse in mice that are either globally deficient for IL-10 or that, that are missing IL-10 exclusively in CD4 expressing cells. And as you can see that the incidence of rectal prolapse basically overlaps. And so in, in our mind that put together a, a, a model where CD4 T cell derived IL-10 in the intestines is important by signaling to, to macrophages for keep maintain the macrophages in what, what Phil Smith liked to refer to as a state of inflammation energy and thereby preventing these aberrant responses to the gut microbiota. And we ourselves using the mouse model that Tim described um, in his introduction, had we, so we had made this IL-10, this IL-10 reporter model where in cells that turn on, the IL-10, activate the IL-10 locus would express by 1.1 on the cell surface. And then we can use for cytometry to detect the cells that, I, that, we call a, that we consider IL-10 competent. And the point of this is to illustrate to you that yes, in the, in the intestines, in the small and large intestines, there are large frequencies of IL-10 competence in the four T cells. And that the, the, the distribution even varies a little bit between small intestine and the large intestine. And so in the large intestine, you see the majority of regulatory T cells as characterized by the, the transcription factor FOXP3 express robust levels of interleukin 10. Um, and, and we get not so much of the approximately three negative TR1 light cells um, that are being described. It, the, the situation is reversed in this small intestine where the majority of the IL-10 producing cells actually seem to be approximately negative, but yet just like in the colon, the majority of regulatory T cells, FOXP3 express regulatory T cells co-express IL-10. So we put all this together and hopefully it paints a picture for you that CD4 T cell derived IL-10 is really a, a, an essential mediator of immune regulation in the intestines. So again, what we were trying to explore was the potential relationship between ICOS, the ICOS ligand, sorry, and, um, and IL-10 in maintaining gut homeostasis. And so this cartoon again is meant to illustrate, it, so meant to illustrate the interaction between APCs and CD4 T cells during an immune reaction. And so here represented 11 antigen presenting cells. As we know, the, the, when antigen presenting cells and T cells interact, signal one is usually this presentation of antigens via MHC class two to the T cell receptor, which is in downstream signaling. Um, but signal two is what's called this co similatory interactions. And, and many of them are illustrated here because we've, you know, over the years we've, we've added more and, and beyond the term, term co stimulation might actually be an oversimplification because we actually now know that there are multiple functions of many of these uh, pathways are ligand, ligand receptor in interactions in CD4 T cell biology. But to bring it back home to I guess ligand, so again, I guess ligand express an antigen presenting cells and I cast the, the receptor is upregulated shortly after TCR activation. And that interaction, at least in the mouse, has been reported to be a monogamous, a monogamous interaction. Um, and that becomes important uh, as we go along here. And so we didn't, th this wasn't a guess for us. We had reason to believe that this interaction may be in some way modulating or affecting IL-10 production in the intestines, because based on the literature, we, we, there was already quite a bit in the literature actually, um, work done by a number, of, a number of groups, a number of outstanding people in the field demonstrate in that uh, regulatory T cell expansion, survival, and IL-10 production uh, were in some ways impacted by 
ICOS like and ICOS signaling. And the, the, and the other function that, that we thought may be at play here is the, 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 the involvement of ICOS like and ICOS like and ICOS in T follicular helper cell differentiation, which means a direct impact on the production of T dependent anti commensal antibodies. And so basically, the, the, the initial question that we had was whether or not this ICOS ligand, or excuse me, this ICOS ligand ICOS interaction is in any way important for the induction of these temp producing populations that we see in the intestines. And again, as I said earlier, I said, I, said, I said a few minutes ago, this interaction, at least in the most, has been described as a monogamous interaction, meaning ICOS ligand interacts with ICOS and ICOS with ICOS ligand. And so for reasons that I can't get into, for a very because it would be a very long story, um, we had in-house the ICOS deficient mice. And in the assumption that that's a monogamous interaction, we went ahead and started doing some examination of the gut regulatory T cell populations in those mice. It had already been demonstrated that um, in ICOS knockout mice, that there's a there were huge frequencies and numbers of oxygen 3 expressing cells. That was already known. What we saw was that in large intestine, that that difference was there, but it was it was way more pronounced, both in terms of the frequencies of oxygen 3 expressing cells and the numbers of, of, of oxygen 3 expressing cells, despite the major difference in the numbers of total CD4 T cells. And then when we looked a little further and then drilled down on those fox 3 expressing cells and looked at the expression of this, this um, marker Helios, which had been described all of somewhat controversially to specifically mark thymically derived cells. What we saw was that in the large intestine, whereas the majority of uh, regulatory T cells are of this Helios low phenotype in ICOS deficient mice, the majority of these cells were, 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 were high for uh, express high levels of, of helios, and that's illustrated here in, in this graph. And so it, it, it suggested that there's, a, the, there's both a, a, an enhanced reduction in fox 3 expressing cells in the large intestine, and the distribution you know, in terms of the helios expression was also altered. And one of the things that, you know, the, the, the idea that, you know, in the, in the, in, in the, in the, um, the large intestine, the, 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 the complement of CD4 T cells was the same. The, there's a reduced level of oxygen 3, but the mice are still healthy. Um, we kind of wonder, it, it seems to suggest that there had to be some sort of replenishment of this oxygen 3 expressing pool to ensure that that deficiency does not ultimately lead to autonomy. And one of the things we did was we, we measured what are called um, T cell receptor exigent circles um, by products of, of, of CR rearrangement um, during time of development. And, and one of the things that we found, and so you can measure TREX as, as an indication of the overall time output. And, and one of the things that we found was that there seemed to be an, an increased time output of fox 3 expressing cells in ICOS knockout mice, perhaps to, to compensate for the, 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 the loss of box to express themselves over time, as I will demonstrate in a second. So that, that again, so that suggests that, that again, there's a, there, there's a defect with the, the reduced box to express themselves. It, 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 it made sense when you put that with what we, what we knew about fox 3 t cell, fox 3 regulatory T cell expansion. And the, and the role of ICOS there. So we then look to ask whether or not this happens for peripherally derived T regs. And so this complicated system I, I, I walked you through, but Chuck Ellison had generated this mouse, the CBO1 transgenic mouse, where the mouse expresses a T cell receptor that recognizes an antigen expressed by commensal that's here. And so we took that TCR transgenic, and, and the idea was that that antigen is only expressed in the intestines. And so we, we hypothesize that any regulatory T cells that develop in that mouse um, should be specific for the gut antigen and a bona fide peripheral regulatory T cell. And so here we're just looking at CBO1 transgenic mice and a wild type background, so just like any other TCR transgenic. And what happens in TCR transgenics, as we know, on a normal background is that you still sometimes get endogenous alpha rearrangement. And so even in those mice, you can get 
regulatory authorities are developing the timers independent of what that carbonate antigen is. And so to limit that kind of secondary allocation rearrangement requires these mouse onto the rag knock of that drug. And what happens then, you're not getting any thymic developed, any thymic regulatory T cells, but in, in the gut where the antigen is expressed and the TCR, can only, the TCR can only see that antigen, then we see regulatory T cells developing as shown here. And, and so then when we took that mouse and we crossed it onto the icos knock of that drug, we again saw reduced frequency of, of FOX3 expressing cells, suggesting that whether these TRLs were developing in the thymus or developing extrathymically, that there was a defect in the, the, there was a reduction in, in the frequency and numbers of FOX3 expressing cells. And that's kind of uh, illustrated here, graphically summarizing all the data. So then we, we, we took it one step further, as we know, um, FOX3 deficient mice develop spontaneous autoimmunity, fatal spontane, um, spontaneous autoimmunity, within about the first four weeks of life. And so we asked whether or not these ICAS deficient cells, which again, seem to have this defect that we weren't really sure what it was, but we at least knew the numbers were reduced. Now we question whether or not as the numbers fall off over time, in case that's what was happening, would they be incapable of rescuing the FOXP3, the FOXP3 um, knockout mice? And so what normally happens is FOXP3 FOX3 deficient, well, our, the experiment that we did was we took FOX3 deficient mice that were on the city 45.1 background. And on the second day of life, we, transpa we transplanted these pups with um, wild type, uh, I guess deficient city 45.2 expressing cells, which allow us to track them as we went along. And we just put them in and left and, and, and tracked the survival and, and other things in these mice over time. And in this figure that's blurry for some reason, Looking at the percent, the, the overall survival, and again, our, our controls being just FOX3, just wild type FOX3 positive cells, or FOX3 negative cells that, sorry, FOX3 knockout mice that, that, that succumb to autoimmune disease really early in life. When we transplanted in uh, wild type regulatory cells, that we could keep most of these mice alive up to uh, upwards of, of 200 days, but um, prior to that, all of the mice. That we had given ICOS knockout T Rex cells had, 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 had succumbed. Uh, we, in, in, in the follow up experiments, we actually stopped some of these animals at around 105 days of age and, and actually compared the FOX3 expression in the recipients of wild type or ICOS knockout T Rex cells, as shown here on the left and the right. And so, here again, looking at the donor cells, that cells that went in as FOX3 expressing cells. In the wild type mice, we see that the uh, vast majority of them still expressed um, high levels of FOXP3. Uh, uh, vast majority of them still expressed FOXP3, whereas in the ICOS knockout mice that was reduced. And again, suggesting that over time, we're actually losing this, and, and which is the reason why if we let them go longer, they eventually succumb. And here again, just summarizing that again, that overall on these, what you would consider homeostatic conditions, that there continues to be this reduction in FOX3 expressing, in FOX3 expressing cells when the cells are deficient in ICOS. We took it a step further then because again, that's on the homeostatic conditions. And we, we asked what happens then if you took these ICOS deficient cells and you drop in, into an inflammatory environment. And so we turned to the Fionopori model, the T cell transfer model of colitis, whereby if you transfer CD45 RB high, uh, expressing CD4 T cells into a mouse, that mouse develops chronic uh, gut inflammation that, that, that really doesn't um, ever, ever remit. But um, other groups have shown prior to this that you can also rescue that colitis if at a certain time point after the induction of disease, you gave a co-transfer of wild type regulatory T cells. And so we asked whether or not the ICOS knockout T cells are the same. And here showing the, the weight change of these mice over time, as you can see. So here would be our mice treated with wild type regulatory T cells that actually got rescued. But similar to the, our mice given C45 RB high cells only, the mice given ICOS knockout T Rex cells continue to lose weight and develop um, severe disease, as illustrated in the bottom here, um, with histology scores comparable to what we saw in mice that did not get any T-Rex transfers. When we 
then looked at the, the FOXY3 expression, um, again, among the donor cells, the wild type donor cells and the IGOS knockout donor cells, what you see again here is this dramatic reduction in the, the, the frequencies of FOXY3 or cells that were still expressing FOXY3 under these circumstances. Uh, yeah, and that, that, that summarizes here. And again, it, what, what we found really striking was that it's not, it's not that the cells that went in as IGOS negative T-Rex were were dying off or disappearing, they were just losing expression of FOXP3. And this was, a, the, I guess, the, the, one, of the, one of the early indications we had that this was an issue where it, it wasn't a survival issue in terms of the regulatory T cells. It was, the issue was related to the loss of expression of FOXP3, which to this point are now being described. And so, as, as many of you know, uh, Sasha Lensky had very elegantly mapped the conserved non-coding sequences in the FOX3 locus that control various aspects of TREG development and, and function. And I want to focus your attention here on this conserved, conserved non-coding sequence two, which also holds what has been what had been earlier described as a TREG specific demethylated region. And that region, um, Sasha clearly showed, is, is important for the herit heritable maintenance of FOX3, so that over time, as FOX3 positive cells continue to divide, that they maintain stable expression of FOX3. And so, in, in, in a, a standard in the field, a gold standard in the field, is to actually measure the methylation pattern in this, in the CPG islands, in this region, as an indication of the stability of FOX3 expression. And so what happens is that during T-Rex differentiation, that region becomes dim it, it, that region of epoxy three gene becomes demethylated, leading to stable expression. And so here, when we looked at method, when we did pyro sequencing to look at the methylation patterns in epoxy three, in epoxy three CNS two, well, surprisingly, what we found was that the methylation in icos deficient T-Rex was similar to that of naive CD4 T cells. And so. Here we have a situation then where FOX3 expressing cells have this methylation defect um, and have, have this, this, have this, 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 this issue where they, they, they're not stable expression of FOX3 being induced, but icos division mice don't succumb to the kind of spontaneous immunity that you see in FOX3 deficient mice. We, 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 we believe that the, the TREG, um, that the increased dynamic output helps to compensate for some of that. And the other thing that maybe that, that we thought maybe contributing to this was when we then crossed those mice back to the IL-10 reporter mouse and looked at expression of IL-10 in these mice, we, we went into this thinking of, as I mentioned, that high cost deficiency would precipitate a reduction in IL-10 producing cells because of what had been reported regarding the function of IL-10, sorry, of high cost in promoting IL-10 expression. And what we saw instead was that there really was no defect in induction of IL-10. Um, in fact, if you, again, if you look closely here, where as we had shown before, most of the FOXP expressing cells express, express uh, IL-10, there's a reduced number of them, but there seemed to be this compensatory increase in FOXP expressing, in FOXP3 negative IL-10 producing cells, which, and we haven't really, um, delineated this very clearly, but which could be a result of either the NOVA induction of IL-10 from non foxy expressing cells, or these could actually be cells that used to be foxy 3 but because of the loss of foxy 3 expression, because of the instability, now, uh, 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 now shift into the foxy 3 negative fraction under these circumstances. But the, the, the net takeaway from it was that, unlike what we hypothesized, the ICAS expression was not required for the induction of IL-10 in the CD4 T cells and, they are, and extra, the, the IL-10 being produced may actually be helping to compensate for some of the loss of, of, of FOXP3. And so then again, going back and digging deeper and now looking at the specifically at the FOXP3 expressing cells where, as we said at the outset, majority of them are of this Helios low variety. In the ICOS deficient mice, when we looked at the IL-10 expression and how that overlaps, then there was this altered distribution again where there was elevated frequency of helios expressing IL-10 positive cells uh, under these circumstances. And 
the I attend think the reason why we think that it may be actually be compensatory is that when we actually aged the Icos knockout mice uh, and, and analyze them at various time points up to 16 months of age, what we saw was this increasing frequency of IL-10 producing cells in, in the colonic lamina propria of ICOS deficient mice. And, and, and then again, finally, to actually drive home this point that under homeostatic conditions, ICOS knockout cells are still adequate. One, because in those mice, you still would get normal if not elevated expression of IL-10. And that's usually enough in the clean, specific pathogen free systems that we work with to keep any potential inflammation at bay. And this was just demonstrating here, if we then repeat the colitis experiments, and in, in on these circumstances, we would co-transfer the regulatory T cells with the silver particle of RBI cells. So it's basically a, an in vivo, an in vitro, an in vivo suppression assay, if you will, that we could have even the, the IGOS knockout. Um, regulatory T cells can now actually prevent disease development. And again, you could see we are, compared to what we saw under the inflammatory conditions we got in the last of FOXP3 that it, under homeostatic conditions, it wasn't nowhere near um, that significant, which again makes the point that under homeostatic, under homeostatic conditions, there's not that much of a defect, which would explain why after years of working with ICOS knockout mice and despite this T-reg defect that we seem to be uncovering, that I guess knockout mice is still largely fine until you induce some kind of uh, inflammation inducing stimulus. So to, so to summarize all this, then I think the, the, the net effect of this work for us is that we believe that ICOS is actually necessary for imprinting the epigenetic stability of FOX2-3 positive T-Rex cells. And that that's especially critical for the function in, in inflammatory settings. But uh, contrary to what we hypothesized, it appears that ICOS is not essential for induction of IL-10 in C4 T cells. And, and that's illustrated here. Now, I remind you that we got into this because again, there was a loss of function, ICOS ligand, <laughs> with allele that was associated with the disease. And we made the assumption that it's a monogenic association. And we studied the ICOS knockout mice and from the t effect. And I credit Robin Lorenz for this because she always challenged me on that in the sense that in doing so, I'm still not directly probing the impact of ICOS ligand itself. And so we eventually got the Icos ligand knockout mice and crossed it to the, the, the 10 bit. And you know, this was one of those situations where you get you where, where I had one of those, you know, whiskey, you know, um, whiskey tango foxtrot kind of moments, right? Um, because what we saw in the Icos knockout mice was not re repeated in the Icos ligand knockout mice. In fact, the, the FOX3 levels were normal, the IL-10 levels were elevated, and that's kind of illustrated here. Um, we use FOX3 frequency and numbers in the ICOS, not so much in the ICOS like a knockout mice, increase IL-10 under both circumstances. And especially if we go into lamina probe where we sort out the CD4 T cells, simulate them in the vitro to actually measure IL-10 protein output that we saw in the ICOS knockout, and especially in the ICOS like a knockout mice, we were getting this enhanced production of interleukin 10. So at a minimum, in both situations, we saw this increase, the normal increase IL-10, but the FOX3 the Fox, Fox issue was different. And um, when we took it one step further, did the private sequencing again to look at the methylation in FOX3 CNS2, it, there again, it was clear for us that the Icos and knockout mice had um, wild type levels of, 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 of uh, demethylation, which, uh, Again, which then suggests that there's a discordance here. Now, I'm sure, as you listen to this, you'll be expecting that I'm going to tell you next that we went and figured out why this is, and, and that's not the case. We still don't understand. Uh, we still don't understand what is different, what's, what's controlling this difference. We've done our due diligence. We went back, we genotyped, we, we differentiated the MDCs in vitro, we stimulated them, make sure that knockouts did not upregulate IL-10, sorry, upregulate ICOS. We, we confirmed that these mice are deficient in ICOS, in ICOS ligand, but there is this, 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 this difference between the receptor knockout and ligand knockout that we still don't have a very good explanation for. So, but that being said, um, we, 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 we look then as to, well, uh, what then could be, if, this is, if, if we have this, we have this 
Icus ligand alkylmatch, we still have this IL-10, this increased IL-10 phenotype. And we have this, this discordance with the regulatory, regulatory T cell data. Is there some role for Icus ligand itself in, in, in gut homeostasis that we still need to probe and explore? And so we, we began to think of the other function of Icus ligand in, in, in that we described, that we mentioned earlier, and that is this role in typical helper cell differentiation. As illustrated here, we had that interaction between germinal center B cells and typical helper cells involved in Icus ligand and Icus interaction. And if you take away, it's been demonstrated that if you disrupt this interaction, the TFA cells basically leave the germinal center and lose their TFHness. And so that interaction we know to be important for the development of T dependent antibodies. And it, it, it's, it's also known that the, the data in, in people regarding loss of the Icus, Icus ligand pathway aligns more with defects in antibody responses than it does with a defect in uh, regulatory T cell development, stability of function, actually. And so, what, what, what happens, um, what's been described, and this is not an exhaustive list by any sense, it's been shown time and again in Icus deficient patients, and then more recently in Icus ligand um, deficient patients, that what these patients suffer is combined immunodeficiency and, and the predominant. Um, phenotype is an in a in like fre frequent and recurring infections and an ability to mount solid, um, robust antibody responses under those circumstances. And so here we were then, we, we had described a T-reg defect resulting from ICOS deficiency that didn't manifest in the ICOS ligand deficiency. But that meant then that the ICOS ligand deficient mice don't have that confounding T-reg defect that, that could potentially mess with our studies of the antibody function of Icus ligand in the gut. Okay, and so in some ways it's, it's basically taking what was a negative and turning it into a positive so that we can go on and ask additional questions about how Icus ligand may be involved then perhaps in this realm. And so again, so we, we, we confirmed again that this T reg, sorry, that the T follicular helper cell defect was indeed there. So by, by looking at the proximal, middle, and distal colon for the two follicular cells cells in, in 10 bit uh, Icus ligand or Icus ligand deficient mice. And one of the things that we found was that the most, which was a little surprising too, was that the most pronounced induction we thought of T follicular helper cells was in the lymph nodes draining the proximal region of the colon. Okay. And so, but you know, across the board, you can actually see TFHs and they're basically gone in the Icus ligand alpha mice. Again, the B cell defects appear to be there. We then went back to, since, since this mice were crossed to the reporter. When we looked at the, the 5.1.1 induction as an indicator of IL 10 uh, expression, we again looking at the wild type mice, we see uh, a good distribution of IL 10 producing cells in the proximal, middle, and distal colon lamina propria. But in the Icus ligand deficient mice, predominantly proximal colon, which is where we were actually seeing the highest frequencies and numbers of T follicular helper cells draining in the nose drain that region. We saw the highest, so really robust levels of IL-10 producing cells uh, in the proximal colon to a certain extent in the middle colon. And this is all illustrated here in terms of frequencies and numbers. And so here again, we, we see this observation where either ICOS knockout, ICOS ligand knockout, we don't see a defect in IL-10 and in fact, on these circumstances, we actually see enhanced expression by IL-10. We then, if we're losing T-dependent antibodies, then this should somewhat phenocopy what's seen in the gold standard for T-dependent antibody deficiency, which is the TCR beta delta knockout mice. And so we compare laminopropia IgA and IgG plasma cells in wild type, I guess like a knockout mice to TCR beta delta knockout mice and saw similar reductions under both um, circumstances in both IgA and in IgG as illustrated here. And we have taken this observation, these two observations, and, and we, we, we say to any reviewer, any, any paper or grant reviewer who would listen, that we, we believe that in, some, in, in, in certain respects, this makes Icus ligand deficiency a superior approach to modeling T-dependent antibody deficiency. Because as I just showed you, what we seem to be seeing is this compensatory increase in CD4 divided IL, in CD4, in, in CD4 divided IL-10, which you would never see in a TCR beta delta knockout mouse. And as I, will share very, as I will share a little later, we've taken this a, a, a step further to actually capitalize on 
what we think is that novel relationship between those two. So again, here we, we, we looked at IgA and IgG in the plasma and in the colon mucus of the icos ligand deficient mice, again, compared to the CCR beta delta not mice, and we saw similar trends where these reductions in IgA and IgG in the colon mucus actually, we, and, and we're still working through what this, the, the significance of all of this, we actually don't see a dramatic drop in total IgA, but again, we can tell um, in, 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 a, in a wild type mouse, uh, whatever, you know, which component of the IgA pool that we're seeing is T dependent or T independent, but it may suggest that in the icos ligand deficient mice that there may be compensatory increases in T independent IgA that we, we're not clear on. But uh, the point is, uh, under both circumstances, we see slight, slight or insignificant reduction in either IgA or IgG when we take away icos ligand, uh, when we knock out the icos ligand. Okay, and so to put all this together then, you know, we, we, we got to a point where we, we had studied these two models and when we compare them to wild type mice, we saw that in ICOS, um, in the ICOS knockout mice, we're losing laminopolfox I mean, cells. Um, we were losing the, 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 the reduced numbers of the T follicular regulatory T cells. Um, but in the ICOS ligand knockout mice, like those two things, uh, phenocopy wild type mice. What was similar was that we lost the, 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 the T follicular helper cells in colon draining um, lymph nodes, and we were losing IgA and IgG antibody secreting cells under both circumstances. But simultaneously, there was this increase in IL-10. And so we speculated that perhaps it's these things that are linked. It's the antibody, it's the, it's the, the antibody producing functions of I, the icos icos ligand pathway that's actually connected here, uh, synergizing here with the CD40 cell divided by 10 that continues to increase in the absence. And so the easiest way to question those kinds of things, obviously, is to knock both genes out. And so we we took the, the icos ligand knockout mice and we crossed it to a conditional knockout of IL-10. And so these are mice that have IL-10 deficiency restricted to the CD4 T cell compartment. And here, just looking at like the and, we, and and this was a little far too, just, but we started really early. Um, but by four weeks of age, shortly after we weaned these mice, we could actually see this elevated lipocaine that kind of continued until we eventually got to Saxon these mice. And when we opened them and looked that there was severe colitis in these mice that probably um, started from really early on in life. Okay, and so we 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 walked away thinking, okay, the correlation correlation of these two pathways uh, results in this juvenile onset colitis, which suggests that that interaction that synergy was important even much earlier, excuse me, even much earlier in life. And so we, we did these cross fostering experiments. And again, this can get a little bit complicated. So I try to be careful about explaining to you. But one, what, what, what we did was to get mice that were icos ligand, icos ligand sufficient, icos ligand deficient, cross to mice with a, with a homozygous flux allele of IL-10. And so for all intents and purposes, these are wild type, these are mounds that are wild type for the IL-10 um, phenotype, for the IL-10 genotype, sorry. And then we cross them with males that would allow us to introduce the, 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 the pre-expressing genes. And so under those circumstances, we would generate pups that are icos ligand um, sufficient, or uh, pups that are icos ligand deficient, and some of which would have the, 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 the pre-expressing allele, okay? And so, and, and then we, we, we did these time mailings and to cross some of the, 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 the wild type pups and, and foster them with the knockout, um, with the knockout mom and vice versa. And, you know, when we look again at lipocaine in three and seven weeks of age, what we saw was that the, 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 the pups that were knockout and fostered on their own, that were like an like inhibition to foster, um, fostered on their own mom, um, already had this elevated lipocaine that continued throughout life, but also the, the, the pups that were I guess, ligand deficient but faster than a wild type mom had the same effect um, going on, although that came a little bit later, which then suggests then that 
in, in the in, in the face of, of IL-10 deficiency, that there's an, there, there's an important role, it seems, for, I guess, ligand dependent, I would believe anybody is, I guess, some maternal factor derived from, I guess, from, from the mom that's important for preventing this early onset colitis that we saw in the, in the, in the, in the, knock, in the total knockout mice. And so we, 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 we went back to ask whether or not there may be an, anybody, um, a role for this anybody, anybody specifically here. So we repeated this cross faster experiments and this time just, just looking, at eliminating the IL-10 deficiency so that we're not confounding this with any potential for inflammation. And we looked at just mice and a white type like a knockout cross faster than that and then analyze the, 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 this, uh, the serum in the lumen IG and serum in the lumen IG. And, and one of the things we found was that, which is still kind of interesting to us, was that the, so in the, in the, in the mice that we, that were first, that, that were knockout mice, stayed with the mom, that if we look in the, at the lumen IgA, that again, there is a robust level of IgA, which again, neither the mouse nor the, Mom can make it dependent IG antibodies here. So it may just be some massive compensation in, in, in IgA output. When we look at the, the IgG in both the serum and in the mucus, what we found was that the only time we really saw a defect in a, a significant defect in the antibody levels was if both the pup and the mom were deficient in icosylin, which suggests then that under normal circumstances that their contributions from both the, the the, the mom be the best medical perhaps, and 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 um and, and I guess it, it from starting from utero, but the contributions from both the mom and the and the um and the offspring itself to the overall antibody pool that exists earlier in life, which may be important for facilitating uh, the colonization that's ongoing. And as you know, I mean, there's you know IgG, for example, has kind of been getting. A, a, a little bit more attention now in terms of its role as an anti-commensal antibody that's helping to mediate homeostasis in the intestines. Um, most recently, in, in a nice publication from Melody Zhang uh, in Science Immunology this past weekend. And so, getting back to the, the, the role of the antibodies under these circumstances, then, as we know, it, 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 we've, we've come to appreciate over the last decade or so that there's a significant fraction of antibodies traversing the lumen of small intestine and large intestine that are actively coated by, by uh, predominantly IgA. And that, uh, as um, Abbe Bendelak, the Bunker has shown, that th th there are some organisms, and it's, it's seemingly those that are potentially better at approaching the epithelium and potentially even adhering to it, that maybe inducing somewhat of a T-dependent response to these um, organisms. And so we, we, we compare the IgA coding of um, feces from wild type and icus ligand, icus ligand deficient mice. So we didn't really see any difference under those circumstances. And again, most of those antibodies are rumored to be T-independent anyway. So then we, what we did was we took the, the, the fecal matter, the, the luminal contents, and we generated this lysate. And we do this crude assay where we use the lysate more or less as a capture reagent in, in an ELISA. And so we coat the plate with the lysate. And then we, on top of that, we put the, the paired serum and then measure how much serum antibody actually detected, um, bound to that lysate. And here, when, when we look, we actually start with use levels of IgA and IgG binding to the luminal lysate, but it was actually most pronounced when we looked at the, at the, we did the same thing where we sucked off the mucus, spun out the bacteria and used that to actually make what we call a mucosal lysate and mucosal bacterial lysate. And there again, we saw this um, huge difference in serum antibody binding to the antigens derived from the, the, the mucus, so what we call the mucus associated bacteria. And we took it a step further using an assay that Chuck Elson has developed uh, and a system that he has in his lab where you can take antigens either from whole bacteria or specific proteins and you can block them onto the nitrocellulose pads and then you can probe your, the serum that you have and weed out the fluorescent. You can probe serum and come back with a, a secondary antibody that actually helps you detect how much binding you have of your serum antibodies, IgA or IgG in our case, to those antigens. 
And so using a vast array of either purified flagellin antigens or whole bacteria extracts that Chubb had, we actually took wild tetanitis like a knock on mice uh, uh, and just collected the serum and blasted it against uh, a, a, a number of these antigens. And what we saw was that there are very specific cases where there's a dramatic difference in terms of, so, uh, pardon me, but so each lane represents an individual mouse um, in, in one of a couple of experiments. And so what we saw was that there were uh, dramatic differences in the amount of IgA binding we detected to specific antigens when we compared wild type and I guess like on deficient mice. And, but you also had uh, circumstances where we, you know, we, we got no binding or the binding was somewhat similar. And that was especially the case in the IgG, where again, looking at some of these flagellin antigens, like CCA4, for example, where we see differences in the binding of the antigen, um, of, of, of binding of serum antibodies to these antigens. But then we, we also had these circumstances where they really did not seem to be any difference. And so, you know, we've tried to um, start to uh, extrapolate these and, and, and explore whether or not, it, what, what does it mean that, whether or not this means that the antibodies that we're detecting here are actually key independent antibodies. It doesn't matter whether or not you have like a slide and you kind of get the same binding because these organisms don't require that. Whereas some of these organisms, and not only organisms, but these are progenin antigens, so the specific antigens that they, that they produce actually elicit more of a T-dependent versus T-independent response. And so if you put all this together, you could, you could see where perhaps using this system, we could actually start probe those organisms that we think are eliciting what seems to be more of a, a, a targeted and potentially harmful response if we are, are preventing more, more potentially harmful response at the expense of these bacteria that can get such, that, that can gain more greater proximity to the epithelial border. And so in, in our quest again to start to, to understand what are the organisms that may be um, leading this. We thought, well, uh, in, in the adult stage, for example, in, in these adult mice where we have this increased levels of IL-10, <clears throat> that in as much as we demonstrated that in early life, there's a synergy between, we think between IL-10 and cyclic and dependent antibodies, does that, does that extend into adulthood? And so taking advantage of the fact that one, we have an IL-10 report that expressed on the surface of the cells, and we have antibodies that would allow us to transiently remove that IL-10 producing fraction. <laughs> That's what we did. And so we, we took mice that were 10-bit um, wild type or icos like and deficient, and we treated them with a vehicle and anti type 1.1 antibody. And, and this is basically our experimental design. Um, it's a vehicle control showing you that we didn't deplete anything. And if we treat with an IL-10 I one point one body, we could deplete the IL-10 producing cells. And so th this is basically showing you in between two depletions. I think this started on day 11. So basically the last projection here was on day 10. And so in this interval right here is what we're measuring. And as you can see that, you know, we the I one point one cells they depleted in the I guess like a knockout mice, but you could actually see that by five days you're starting to see a rebound of the IL-10 producing cells. And this is the main reason why we do this every five days, because the, 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 some reason in the absence of the icos ligand, and we believe because of the absence of the T-dependent anti-commensal antibodies, there's this urge to continue and, and, and to, to, to turn on CD4, to turn on IL-10 predominantly from CD4 T cells. But when we did that though, and, and looked at the mice, what we found was that, again, over the course of time, um, the, 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 the mice, the, the icos ligand mice depleted the IL-10 producing cells did not, you know, go at the same rate as, as, as the, the, the other three groups. There was this early spike in lipocalin that only, that only went up and those mice developed severe colitis that, you know, you know surprisingly to us somewhat um, was predominantly restricted to the proximal colon, which if you think back to the data I showed you earlier, that's honestly the region where we saw the greatest frequencies of, of, of no, a number, sorry, of t follicular helper cells and of IL-10 producing CD4 T cells. So it kind of starts to come together, at least in our mind, where the, the, the organisms in that region seem to be preferentially eliciting both 
both if she dependent antibody response, uh, at least not all of the organisms, but specific organisms that may uh, colonize predominantly, the, the, predominantly the, the proximal large intestine are inducing this high frequency of typical helper cells and of uh, 10 producing CD4 T cells, and we could disrupt those two pathways, even transiently to develop this, this rapid onset colitis. And this is just demonstrating that, yes, the inflammation is characterized by high frequencies of IL-17 IL producing and gamma producing cells, and that's all uh, summarized for you over here. And so one last thing we did then was to ask how and we um, are, are to, to start to get a sense of the bacterial communities that were driving this. And um, we don't have very definitive answers on this yet, but just to point out, one of the experiments that we did was to actually take um, wild type and like in division mice again, using that IL-10 depletion model. And we treated the mice with antibiotics, um, RB and, and this was antibiotic by garbage daily. Um, actually landed, you know, was kind of a hero in, 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 in doing all these experiments. And so there were daily injections of, of daily garbages of antibiotics. And, and then we started with our type 1.1 depletion regimen. Uh, and, and these are the antibiotics that we use, colistin to actually help us get rid of gram negatives, metronidazole for the anaerobes, vancomycin for the positives. And then we did a combination of metronidazole and pisolin, neomycin and vancomycin to try to get rid of you know, as much bacteria as we could. And the, the, the take home message from all of this, it, uh, as I'm trying to illustrate for you here, is that both metronidazole, uh, of, of course, as expected, the total depletion of bacteria did inhibit the, the colitis development but so did metronidazole and to a certain extent uh, treatment with vicomycin. And so we kind of take that loosely to mean that there's some bacteria that may fit the description of aerobic, anaerobic and gram positive that may be mediating the colitis that we see in this IL-10 depletion model. And so now we, you know, we, 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 we have, I guess, at our disposal, a lot of, a, a number of models and human isolates courtesy of, 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 of Chuck Elson, that would allow us then to probe those relationships, the, 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 the microbes, the microorganisms that we think based on the regions that we can isolate them from, that may be eliciting both the, the C-dependent response and this, IL-10, and this robust IL-10 production. You know, we, we, we have the view um, based on this experiment, actually, let me, I should show you this experiment first. So one of the things we've done so far, we've got a germ, germ facility here, and so we've tried to generate mice where we can colonize uh, with uh, microbes of interest and then check the pups over time. But we, we, we've done this a different way. It's a, it's a lot more, it's a bit more time consuming, a bit more expensive. Um, where we, the, the way we, we do it is we transplant germ-free females. So we put the bacteria into germ-free females, at, at adult females, um, usually somewhere between four and seven weeks of age. And so, sorry, adult germ females. And then we would take them once we've colonized, uh, we've confirmed colonization, and then we would breed them with germ free males so that we're not introducing anything. And then we would take the pups that you know, born three weeks later. And that's what that's the mice that we analyze those are the ones that we do the experiments in. I would say that approach because we're really interested. One, we're interested in what's going on in these early stages, and that's probably one of the better ways of getting the mouse, the, the bacteria in, but also it allows us to confirm that um, bacteria are stably colonized before we, 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 we start the breeding and then we can complete the levels of transmission, which, for which there's some biology there as well. And so we did this, I'm, I'm gonna show you this one good experiment where we transplanted either the luminal bacteria, basically we opened the mouse to cover the code and to cover the luminal contents or once the, once the entire lumen was washed and we couldn't see anything, we scraped what was left and transplanted that bacterial fraction. And comparing, I guess, germ-free mice that received the luminal contents are the mucus-associated contents where you can see this robust levels of IL-10 induction um, at three weeks of age in mice that had received the mucus, in, in mice that were born to, to moms that received the mucus-associated bacteria. And again, this is at three weeks of age, um, just as we're getting ready to wean them. So really early on in life, there is robust induction of IL-10 producing cells in mice that receive just immediate associated bacteria, and it's all summarized here. And so that's basically where we are with trying to do some of this, is, is, is using the, trying to use now these systems 
the, the, the tools and some and the Bible repositories that we have at our disposal to kind of try to understand that relationship between what we think doesn't make us associate bacteria, IL-10, and these anticommensal antibodies in the maintenance of both homeostasis. And we obviously believe that we have a model system now that would allow us to in transiently induce uh, transiently remove the IL-10 and induce disease are not under under those circumstances. And so to summarize then, uh, I hopefully uh, you know, I've convinced you at least in this last part that th there's this synergy between CD4 T cell divided IL-10 and um, and I just like independent and the commission antibodies that we believe help to maintain that immune homeostasis in early life and in adulthood. And so we are aware of the fact that you know, there are antigens and some of them that can make it into, into the, the deeper portions of the mucus layer that get collected, uh, that can drive through a development that get um, taken to lymph nodes where they're, where they're presented uh, to, to, to T cells and, and, and induce the development of T dependent anticommensal antibodies. We can then circle back and help to um, to maintain homeostasis with these organisms. And, and what we've hopefully shown is that if we disrupt this axis by just impairing the, 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 the production of these T-dependent antibodies that we get this expansion of IL-10 producing cells seemingly as a compensatory mechanism. And so if we, if we then go ahead and disrupt both, that results in information that we think is largely driven by the, the, these mucus associated organisms, although we don't have very concrete evidence of that um, to, um, to talk about at this time. And so that's where we'll end and, and ho hopefully I didn't go too fast. And if, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to try my best to, to, to answer them at this point. Thank you very much for your time. And thanks again, Tim and the organizers for, for this opportunity. Thanks, Craig, for that excellent talk. So I have um, a question for you. So, you know, how much of the the ICOS ligand um, you know, dependent interaction with Tregs, like how much of that is intrinsic to the Treg? Because you've outlined sort of like a extrinsic mechanism for regulating inflammation in IL-10 production. So have, have you how started? Much, um, how, much ICOS, I mean, how much you said how much of the ICOS ligand interaction with Tregs is intrinsic to the Treg itself? Yeah, or the phenotype. Um, so I, I, I think that the fact that we um, that the, the the methylation during development, you know, which which is initiated during development, the methylation is a, requires a combination of, you know, that is it, essentially, you know, it starts during the initial points of differentiation and secretion shows that over time, it is basically time and turnover that kind of locks it in. Um, so, because it's at that level, I would argue that it's all intrinsic to the to the, to the CD4 T cell. And I think that's potentially what's happening in the Icos ligand knockout mice, that there's something else in the Icos ligand knockout mice that may be still signaling the Icos. And so one of the things I didn't tell you is that in the Icos knockout mice, we, we see very high, sorry, in the Icos ligand knockout mice, we see a very high level of Icos being expressed on the CD4 T cells. And so it's possible that there's something else that's triggering it under those circumstances. And so I would argue that it's all intrinsic to the the case is what is up. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. So we also have another question in chat from Philip, and he's asking if you know if the thymic FOXP3 cells um, are self-specific or are they micro, uh, microbiome reactive or both? Yeah, another question. We don't know. Um, I, I, uh, no, the, the, the answer is we don't know. I, I, I don't even think I need to speculate for you now, Philip, but um, I, we do not know. Okay. Uh, if there's any other questions, go ahead and put them in chat. Um, if not, Craig, thanks for the wonderful seminar. And, yeah, thank um, you. This was, this was fun. It's great having you. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks, guys. All right, we're off.